All right, hey everyone, uh, thank you for coming to the last presentation of the day. Um, today I'm gonna be talking about DevOps for Romney for President because despite my long hair, I actually worked on the Romney campaign in 2012. Um, seems pretty unlikely. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why we actually ended up uh, in some ways parallel to the Obama campaign and our capabilities. We used a lot of testing, we used AWS, uh, we had a very heavily DevOps sort of team where we were responsible uh, not just for writing the application, but involved with hosting it. But also why uh, some of those things are false equivalents, like the fact that we both did testing doesn't mean that we did it in the same way, doesn't mean that we did it optimally. Um, just to start things off, the reason that's interesting to talk about this at Surge, we've actually heard a lot from folks who were on the Obama campaign, uh, particularly from the media. Uh, these are actually all from different articles, these headlines. Uh, we've seen Velocity Talks, uh, we've seen books based on this. There's a lot of information about just how awesome Obama's tech team was. And I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about it because if you're really interested, uh, you can go look this up. But I'll just note uh, in the background that crazy flow chart with uh, all those boxes and diagrams, that's actually just the US West backup that they have. The full chart, if you print it out, is six feet long. Uh, that's their AWS architecture. So it's kind of crazy the things that they did. All this infrastructure structure they have for analytics, um, for statistics about voters, for Facebook. And interestingly, um, you wouldn't know it from some of the media stories, but uh, none of that actually happened on the Romney campaign. We were in AWS, but we were using it in a very different way. Hmm. Okay, I duplicated a slide. But um, you know, if the stories were be, uh, to be believed, uh, basically, the, this is basically what the campaign was, right? It was magic, uh, everything that the Obama tech team was great and amazing. Um, that's you know, actually plausible when you look at the history of how these campaigns differed. Because what you don't hear about on the Obama campaign presentations is how they actually got the resources to do this. Um, so I'm gonna tell a story of something that in some ways is even less plausible than this picture here, and that's this picture. This is me and the governor uh, right after the uh, election, I think November 8th or so. Now before I can tell you the story of how I got to be in this photo, um, well, let me just say it's the result of a bunch of bad decisions. Now, I'm a programmer by hobby, uh, but actually uh, I started off in political science and psychology. So in uh, 2011, I was actually going to uh, grad school for political science, and it turned out I'm actually really, really bad at being a grad student. So I'd been kicked out of that program, and you know, when you're in grad school, you don't have much money, so the idea of turning web development into a paying career, that's actually pretty damn appealing. Um, so somehow I went from getting kicked out of grad school to almost immediately working on the Mitt Romney campaign. This is really that story. But I can't tell you that story if you don't know that much about the election. And of course, not everyone's a political junkie. Uh, not everyone here is even from the US. So I'm gonna do just a little bit of a recap on what was happening in 2012 that made it a really weird election. Now, uh, resource-wise, I picked up a book about this. Um, I found that even coming from this political background, a political science background, I need to do a lot of recap to figure out the ways in which the technology decisions of the two campaigns, respectively, were affected by this. Um, so election 2012 was in a lot of ways a really weird and awful election. Uh, 2008 had been a landslide in political terms. Um, 2010 had not been quite a landslide, but it had been pretty disastrous, the rise of the Tea Party. So there was a lot of expectation over 2012 that it would actually be a winnable uh, election. There's normally incumbent advantage, but there was um, some severe speculation that Obama would actually not get a second term. Uh, some of the reasons for that, there were really changing demographics. Um, the white vote has trended away from Democrats, but also there's a larger Latino vote. Uh, there's also a lot of political polarization that hasn't existed in the past. This has basically just been trending upward for the past 50 or 60 years. People are identifying as more conservative, more Republican, more liberal, more Democrat, all at the same time. Uh, the rise of the Tea Party challenging the traditional power structures within the party was actually concerning not just to liberals but to a lot of Republicans who didn't want to lose control over these existing power structures. Of course, social media, um, just to put things in perspective, in 2008, the website was my.barackobama.com because it was a reference to MySpace. So things changed a lot over just a few years. 
but it was also weird and awful just in a procedural sort of way. Uh, electoral reapportionment is what happens when the Electoral College changes its balance, and it does that in response to population. Just demographically, a lot of Republican-leaning states are actually growing in population relative to Democrat-leaning states, so they actually gained electors relative to 2008 just by virtue of getting more population. Within the Republican uh, Party, uh, delegate awards changed to proportional uh, representation in some cases. This is something that lengthened the primary process because instead of a winner-take-all situation, uh, you could get really bogged down in a primary. And of course, people moved their primaries up that season. So these were longer primaries, more conflicted, less of a decisive outcome. Now when we get to the general, there were some other things that made it really weird. Uh, this is the first election in which both candidates opted not to receive federal funding. If you've ever filled out uh, taxes and they ask you if you want to donate three bucks to uh, sustain the uh, public election system, uh, if you opt into that, you get some money, but you also get a limit on how much money you can spend. Obama was the first to decide not to follow this in 2008. He opted out of public financing. It's pretty unlikely that any presidential candidate will ever opt into it again because they now raise so much money that it doesn't make financial sense. And of course, super PACs, which basically is just a fire hose of money compared to that even. So what we basically have is a situation with immense budgets and a lot of negative campaigning because of that polarization issue. So when we get to the Republican primary, and I'm highlighting that uh, on the timeline in Magenta, um, that was already going on. Even before the general election, it was a huge expenditure. There was a lot of negative campaigning, even between Republicans. And that's really where Mitt Romney's tech team started in the primary. Uh, just as a recap, uh, there were a lot of contenders, and this actually was the first uh, place where you start to see some tech problems in the Romney campaign. Uh, with all these contenders, um, normally we would actually think of this as a really weak field in political science. Like, some of these candidates would not be considered serious ones in other years. But there was this problem that Romney had. He wasn't very popular. People talked about him as an inevitable candidate, and actually the Obama campaign in retrospect has released that they never considered anyone other than Romney to be the eventual nominee. But that's not the way the polling looked. That purple line rising to the top is Romney, and you can see that he actually um, gets uh, beaten out in the polls by four separate candidates at various points in time, and he's only above 20% polling for a very small amount of the primary season. So I kind of like to phrase this in um, sort of lean startup terms. Uh, if you're in a primary, uh, for those who don't know the political process, you're basically shopping your candidate around to prove that they're viable, that they can raise money, that they can convince voters. So Romney didn't actually have a very good MVP, it's just that everyone else's was worse. So rather than being clear and convincing in a victory, it was really a war of attrition. Now, eventually, Romney did uh, become the presumptive nominee. And when you're the presumptive nominee, that just means you have enough backing from electors in the Electoral College that, um, or not Electoral College, rather, uh, at the primary organization from the states, that you're going to be the nominee. But uh, you don't actually become the nominee until the uh, conventions later in the fall. So what we really had as a result of all these factors was a primary where Romney didn't know for sure that he was going to be the nominee until very late in the process after he had spent a great deal of money. So compare that to Obama. Obama's coming in as an incumbent and has basically had four years to prepare on top of just having done a successful campaign. Uh, in fact, the uh, entire time that we're looking at the uh, Republican uh, primary there, the Obama team had actually already started working on many of the technological innovations that you've uh, heard about in media sources. So things like Narwhal, things like Dashboard, their Facebook integration, all their call tools. Um, essentially, they had something like 20 months of total working time on this. You can see that by the time we're at this uh, pink section where Romney is the presumptive nominee and actually has the backing of the national Republican organizations, he has about six months left. So this is one of the first major differences that we see between the campaigns. Uh, just the influence of this primary season, it's really important from the political organization perspective, but 
you have all these candidates warring against each other. They're not collaborating on technology. They're not sharing voter information. Until you have a single person for the party to get behind, you're in a state of conflict. So this talk is in the scaling organizations track. You've noticed that I've barely talked about technology so far. Now we're actually gonna get into some of the tech behind this. Uh, the first thing to note, though, is this number, 8x. This is actually the amount of size that we had to scale the team by. Because at that six month before the election mark in about April, there were 14 members of the uh, Romney digital team. It needed to grow to 110 people before the election. And actually even before the election, uh, within 50 days or so, uh, growing by eight times. Because you can't just hire someone the week before an election, they'll never get onboarded fast enough to have any kind of impact. You needed developers immediately, just as fast as possible. So uh, the Romney campaign, uh, they had actually started in the primaries outsourcing their technology. Um, so essentially they had an external vendor come in and build this website, and they continued that in the general election. Uh, Targeted Victory was the main contractor there for this portion. They had uh, several tech contractors, but I'm focusing mostly on the Mitt Romney website as that's what I actually worked on. Uh, NJI Media started off the website. Uh, they actually ran into some problems with scaling towards the end of the primaries, and they brought in OHO Interactive uh, for some consultancy and advice. They actually ended up handing over the project to OHO Interactive, who really uh, took it off full swing after uh, Romney became the presumptive nominee. Now, as it turns out, it's extremely hard to recruit when you're Republican. Um, now, you might think that, okay, of course liberals aren't going to want to work for a Republican candidate. That makes sense. But then there are also libertarian conservatives. They also don't want to work for uh, main uh, party conservatives often because they find that the party is too ideologically like Christian and just right wing and social issues. They have about as much in common with liberals as they do uh, with conservatives. They tend to vote more conservative, but uh, they're not necessarily gonna be enthusiastic about it. But then we have the last one. It's also really hard for conservatives to hire conservatives. And uh, it turns out there's a really good reason for this. They like money. They go to the private sector and they stay there. They're not willing to leave their high paying six figure job to go work on a political campaign for basically nothing pay. So across the ideological spectrum, conservatives have a really hard time recruiting anyone. They also have poor retention of talent, also for ideological reasons. So you have this idea of small government, you have the idea that centralization is bad. Well, centralization and hierarchies, they actually work really well for organizational specialization. If you don't have them, um, if you try to have every candidate come up with their own technical organization, then we all know that scaling people is an incredibly hard problem. You're asking everyone who comes into the campaign to go scale up their own technical organization rather than having a shared pool of resources. Now, um, if you had just paid attention to the media, you would have gotten the idea that there's this equivalence between the campaigns or that the Romney campaign was sort of like up and coming, uh, an underdog, a challenger, because honestly that just makes a more interesting story if you have the idea of an equal conflict where the outcome is uncertain. That's not really the way that the recruiting worked in the organization. Um, sure, there were some folks from like uh, Google who donated some time, but it was very minimal. And essentially the tech team were all mostly very inexperienced developers. Uh, also, they were hired uh, under extreme time pressure. There wasn't really a ton of time for vetting. Uh, in fact, I went through and looked at my timeline. So I applied to the job on June 4th, got a response that day, interviewed two days later, and had an offer letter two days after that. So basically between when I applied to the job and when I had finished moving to Boston from New York City to take the job was two weeks. Uh, as an aside, you see it shows up as a hidden gem there. Uh, LinkedIn will put that there if you have a job that proportionally nobody is clicking on. That's not too surprising with the nature of this job because uh, it was actually HQ'd out of Boston because that's where Romney's uh, inner circle of supporters were going to be working out of. Um, of course, a very blue uh, city and a very blue state. And it was also a Drupal development position which made recruitment even harder. Now, uh, I've highlighted uh, the section that I was there for, so you can see that uh, technically Ron Paul was still running, um, but you know nobody was taking him seriously at that point. Uh, and actually, I just about tied uh, Rick Perry for how long I lasted in the Republican primary. <laughs> 
This was a really, really weird job, the weirdest job I've ever had. Um, you might think of that as just an email. Um, the part I look at is not the copy. It's actually that box. And that box there is actually uh, mandated by law. Um, the box can have different contents depending on who paid for it. It turns out it's actually incredibly hard to consistently draw a box around text in cross-browser emails. Uh, when you think about things like Lotus Notes, uh, that was basically my first assignment on the campaign. That's when I knew it was going to get really, really weird in terms of development. So I often get asked, what is it like working within an organization like this? Now, it was actually the best workplace I've ever had, and you might not expect to hear that, like a consultant coming into a political campaign, but it was a really unified campaign. Uh, when people talk about how everyone in their company gets along or they have a great corporate culture, I'm never gonna believe them unless they've actually worked on a political campaign. Um, there were essentially no arguments there. There were no uh, personality conflicts. Anything like that really happened at the higher levels behind closed doors. Uh, there was this great sense that you were doing something wonderful for the country, uh, helping people out. And even though I was coming in as a contractor, uh, people didn't ask you like who you worked for, they just assumed you were there because you wanted to go help out the campaign. Also, uh, you have all these disparate roles essentially working very closely together. I could literally just walk down the hall and I'd be at the people doing email, I'd take a corner, I'm at the people updating all the content, uh, posting to social media, all of that in one building. Of course, the job life balance was a little bit crazy. Uh, it started off at something like 50 hours a week and uh, right before the election it was closer to 70 hours a week. Uh, this one time I had just moved up to Boston, of course. I had nothing really to do on the 4th. I just stopped in the office to get some work done and I wasn't the only person there. Uh, there were people constantly there watching news, doing social media updates. Campaigns slow down during certain periods but they never really stop. There was intense publicity too. Uh, actually, they, um, if you watch the news cycle during then, they did a lot of interviews like from the office. In fact, at one point, um, we had this rule where if you were on camera, you couldn't leave your desk because it looks really bad to just have an empty seat. Uh, we had to hold off on a stand-up until our uh, uh, project manager could uh, get out from behind the camera. So we just watched him on CNN uh, while he was uh, sitting there. Now, um, explaining the job to my friends, I'd say, was the hardest part. Uh, just people not understanding why you would go work for someone like Romney, why you'd want to work those long hours. But if you've ever done the startup kind of grind, it's pretty much similar to that. It's something that's hard to understand until you've lived through. So now let's talk about the technology, what we actually built. So when I say mittromney.com and friends, there were some other domains that had a shared code base essentially, like uh, m.mittromney.com for the mobile site or some issue specific websites that were spun up. Now, um, large scale Drupal LSD uh, is what we used. Um, that's not a particular like distribution of Drupal, it's just a set of techniques that you use. And we actually had a very outdated version of Drupal, Drupal 6, uh, and it was using a version called Pressflow that's optimized for large scale instances. And when we say large scale, compared to what the Obama campaign was doing, you have to understand that there are a lot of different scales of large scale. Um, we had something like 20 AWS nodes at peak. Uh, this is not a huge undertaking. Uh, we had a typical MySQL, memcache, varnish uh, stack. That was all hosted on Acquia, their Drupal platform as a service. So their idea is that they have very high tier support. Um, they're all AWS hosted. So like more on the professional services side. And that makes sense for a campaign. They have a lot of money and they're only gonna be around for a little while. So uh, even if they spend a lot of money proportionally on hosting, it's still not gonna be a large chunk of their expenditures. They spend so much money on advertisements that this is really a drop in the bucket. Uh, of course we need a CDN, so we had Akamai. Uh, when you think of a CDN, you usually think of this in terms of like offloading assets. Um, actually, for us, uh, denial of service mitigation, uh, security, uh, and having a static version of the site in case we had a complete outage, those were actually the more uh, important ones. You can get by with a lot from Varnish, but it's harder to do security. And security was actually uh, an issue that we had to worry about. Um, it turns out the Secret Service, when they start uh, following a uh, candidate, they actually also will report on threats to the candidate's website because that's considered part of the candidate's property. Uh, they guard your property, not just your person. Now, um, that's basically a really simple stack. Uh, this is technology that even then was a few years old. It was kind of a well-known problem of how to scale a Drupal website to this level. You might think that we wouldn't have problems with scaling. 
Uh, actually, it was just a few weeks into my tenure there that we had our first outage. And as it happens, it wasn't the, real, uh, the result of uh, black hats there. It was actually black robes. So the Supreme Court uh, decision about the Affordable Care Act was the first time that I had an outage while I was there. Uh, it was a great event for the Romney campaign. Uh, we had all this traffic. Uh, people hated Obamacare. They were really hoping to see a Supreme Court decision that uh, ruled it to be unconstitutional. And there was a decision that not only said that it was uh, constitutional, but had a really weird political rationale for it. So we suddenly started seeing this Republican outrage over the ruling. This was actually our highest donations day ever. People were thrilled in the office. I mean, they hated the decision, but they were so uh, validated to see people uniting behind this candidate who just had a really bitter slog through primary season. But then someone said they were banned from the website. And then someone else said they were banned too, and actually the entire room was banned from the website. Uh, as it happens, we weren't passing through the X forwarded for header, and when you're using Akamai, all of your traffic is visible as coming from a handful of Akamai servers. So the Akamai server that was uh, serving most of the traffic to Boston uh, got IP banned by the website automatically because it was posting so many updates. This is my first brush with what we like to call gremlins. Now, let me just talk a bit about the development team, the people that I was really working with. Um, because that's, that's a bad introduction to a project. Like that's a web scale 101 issue. You need to be able to pass that header through uh, if you're gonna be doing anything IP related because otherwise you're just getting garbage data. A lot of the problems that we ran into, these gremlins, were the result of this being grown and not designed. Remember, this had started as a primary website by a different set of contractors, or even subcontractors, technically. So switching development organizations like that is incredibly problematic in any kind of technology, but especially when you're doing it with something as obscure and hard to learn as Drupal on such a tight timeline. There's also a lot of uh, rapidly changing direction. So just unrealistic expectations, uh, too many cooks in the kitchen. Essentially, you can think of all the different wings of the campaign as being mostly independent actors because you have the RNC who has their own priorities. You have uh, people who might have a priority within the campaign, but they also have to worry about the job they're gonna go back to working for a particular person in a state. Uh, you have advocacy groups who aren't actually part of the campaign, but uh, might have some affiliated channels. Um, so all these people coming together asking for certain sets of functionality. We would have these gigantic lists that we were supposed to slog through, like, you know, this month you're gonna implement social logins, you're gonna implement posting to Twitter, and you're gonna implement one-click donations. I think our group ended up missing about every deadline that was involved there because they were very much pushed down. There was no real ability to push back on any of these requirements or even to be involved in the specification of those requirements. This was all being done at the political level and pushed down to the digital team. Now a lot of this is based on the idea, what's Obama doing? Uh, actually this came back and bit the campaign. Uh, the Obama campaign had a way to save your donation credentials. So you could just press a button and donate again using the same stored data. And uh, actually the pressure to copy this feature was so high that they ended up copying the copy as well. They uh, plagiarized it because they had just meant that to be a design mock-up of how the exact same feature would work and they implemented it like that. Now, you might think that uh, couldn't you just hire better developers, hire more developers, and the answer is actually no. The reason I spent so much time talking about the primary is because uh, the FEC guidelines, they limit where you can spend your money. Romney had spent so much money in the primary that he actually had very little money left during primary season. He was actually on, uh, doing great on fundraising, on par with Obama, but he could only use that money for the general election at that point. So he'd raised about 100 million and then spent 91 million of it, so he only had about 9 million cash on hand, and that sounds like a lot, but I mentioned most of that money is going to advertising. In fact, he had so little money left over for advertising that he had to suspend ads for two weeks in August, just not run any of them through the Romney campaign. Uh, if you remember the 47% quote, that actually came at a private fundraiser because uh, they were just trying to get any more money that they could. Uh, Romney even had to go guarantee a loan personally for $20 million to the campaign because they were that far uh, in the red. 
So we didn't really have quality talent. We didn't have many developers. It really led to a vicious cycle where we had these junior developers and subcontractors, many of whom worked out of the office. They would release bad code. The handful of more experienced developers, uh, they would have to firefight. The project managers would then, after the fire is put out, uh, grill the uh, engineers for explanations. And uh, just for reference, we had about a one-to-one -one ratio of project managers to senior developers. So um, you know, when you do a stand-up, it was like being surrounded by sharks. Um, that only left the junior developers to ship code, which was, of course, perpetuating this disaster. We had an incohesive team and we had an incoherent process. That's what our JIRA workflow looked like. Um, you might think that that looks pretty unpleasant, but I would say this is much more unpleasant. Uh, this is just from a Word document uh, telling you what HTML you needed to paste into what GUI forms in Drupal to get the desired configuration. So uh, I'm a pretty vocal person. I wouldn't be up here presenting if I didn't like talking. So the thing I started doing that helped out the most was complaining, because the other developers had kind of just taken it for granted that it was going to be this way on the campaign. I knew that I couldn't go change everything about this, but I wanted to try and change as much as I could. So one of the first things I did was get us moved from Subversion over to Git. Uh, something like Git Flow. Uh, we had feature branches, a release branch. Uh, this helped immensely. Um, we had this huge problem with developers committing code directly to master. Um, we even had this problem with someone not understanding what it meant to clobber someone's changes, so they were just force pushing things uh, because the GUI client wouldn't let them push. Um, we never switched over our deployments from Subversion. I could never fully uproot it, uh, but it really helped out. Now, we did have to spend a lot of time doing this, so it was really an investment, and we did have to argue for it. Um, that's actually what that merge looked like. It was actually significantly worse than this. Uh, there were so many Subversion branches, uh, all of which only contained the commit history for whatever happened during that branch. I had to merge in like 100 or so branches in Subversion to get a complete Git history. We decided it was worth preserving that because we knew so little about the origins of the site that another company had built that we just didn't want to be without a commit history. So we knew we needed Git, but to get a good history, we had to really perform SVN surgery. Now, switching to Git, um, we didn't do it just because Git is awesome. Uh, we did it because branching plus ACLs. Now, you don't usually think of access control in Git because usually you have well-behaved developers. Now, I love the idea of DevOps discussions, of talking about trust, uh, things like promise theory, and you don't have time for that when you have like three months to go ship something. So what we did is we gave everyone private developer branches. Uh, we let anyone access shared feature branches. But then we only let the senior developers get release branches. If you wanted to get something released, you actually had to go through a release process. So as painful as that JIRA workflow looks, it really helped. Um, the ability to block people from pushing code directly to the server um, was such a huge factor in improving the quality of code. We shipped a lot less code, that's for sure. But the code we shipped was better. After we did the private development branches, we started to tackle one of the other problems we'd run into, people who had development environments that were totally out of sync. And ideally, you just get this ingrained in people. They update their development environments. You use something like Chef or something like Puppet to manage it. Again, that's not something we had time to do. So we did the dead simple approach. Don't ask them for it. Just go log into their server, see what version of the SQL database they're running and what version of Git they're running. And if they're out of date, go yell at them. Sure, it's manual. Sure, it indicates a lack of trust. But when you have such minimal time to actually push for changes within an organization, sometimes something simple that doesn't really rely on coordination and cooperation is the right approach. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that this was basically all punishing developers because we didn't like them. Uh, I was a developer on the campaign, so certainly I wanted to also push for things that were good for developers. Those horrible Word documents really came out of the uh, project management side of things. And I wanted to cut away as many of those as possible. Now, Drupal has a really bad reputation because uh, it's all GUI-based, so you really have to go paste things in. But of course, there are more uh, skilled Drupal developers, ones that do care about separation of concerns. So Drupal Features is a platform by which you can move configuration to code, version control, bundles of features, manage them through a command line. 
Um, we actually switched a lot of stuff over to Drupal features, stuff that had previously been done with those Word documents. And that meant that deploys that used to take three hours and then just bomb and we'd have to back them out manually and there wasn't actually a process documented for how to back them out. Now we could actually just do a checkbox version of it and that really helped. Now, uh, that's what we have in terms of a tech stack. That's what we have in terms of an organization. So how did those intersect? Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have as much time as we'd like to go make changes in a campaign environment like this. So uh, there was a lot of coordination uh, between the uh, coordination problems between the various groups. Uh, one great example of this we ran into with the uh, Paul Ryan announcement. Uh, they did that early in the morning, and it was actually supposed to be a surprise, so most people in the campaign did not know that Paul Ryan was going to be vice president. Uh, that happened on a weekend. Well, they had actually told us that because it was really coming up to uh, the final few days uh, before the conventions, just go home over the weekend, get some sleep, don't check your email. That was the weekend that they independently decided that they were going to be doing this event. Luckily, I checked my email anyways. I knew to be there at the office that weekend. Uh, our sysadmin had not checked his email and had not watched the news. Someone had asked him to go do an HT access change. He did that HT access change manually and redirected all traffic to www.www.mittromney.com, uh, completely breaking the site during the Paul Ryan announcement, uh, which I'm pretty sure took a few years off the life of some of our project managers. So that kind of coordination issue uh, was really persistent throughout the campaign. But we also really started to run into more mundane sorts of scalability challenges. There's someone on Twitter complaining that, you know, it obviously crashed because it was getting too many donations. Now, um, we were getting pretty scared about this. We knew that we were a very limited team. Uh, keeping a website like this running under that kind of sustained national attention is challenging. And we knew that we had our largest planned event coming up until the debates, the Republican National Convention. The idea with the convention is that's when you actually become your party's official nominee and everyone rallies behind you and now it's like a one-man show. So when the Republican National Convention started to come up, we really lobbied to do a load test. So I learned one of the most important lessons about load testing today, uh, that day rather. If you ever have to beg for a load test, make sure you fail it. That's 20 of our servers falling over during that load test. That was a justification that enabled us to actually go and do performance optimizations, the fact that we had failed a load test. So uh, we used a bunch of tools, uh, including uh, getting a, a Drupal consultant from Acquia to come in. Uh, we actually hired a fourth senior developer because we only really had three at that stage. And we actually made it successfully to the conventions and uh, really call it Christmas in August because right at the end of the convention, Governor Romney was able to spend all of those general election dollars. So suddenly money was not a problem where it had been right up until that moment. Uh, and August is really late in the cycle. Just to give you an idea of what that looked like, um, that was uh, right at the end of the month. So, oh, I guess I don't have a mouse. Never mind. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so right around there. And you actually notice that um, down into the right in terms of latency, at the same time that we're going up into the right in terms of traffic. So these performance optimizations, there were a lot of really low hanging fruit. We made the site scale much better than it had at any point in its history. But there were still gremlins because we were saddled with a code base that we hadn't initially written by people who weren't very familiar with Drupal. Uh, essentially because of this outsourced consultancy approach where there was really no check on whether people understood the systems that they were working with or understood the future needs of the system, we ended up with a system that really couldn't cope with demand in very specific ways. So uh, here's one we ran into where uh, someone had actually hard-coded that checkbox inside of a PHP file, so it would not respect the GUI value of that checkbox. Um, actually, that spike is us uh, clearing the cache to reset it. It's a little bit hard to spot, but you can see that uh, suddenly everything gets a little bit faster. That was actually a traffic change driven just by our mobile site. Essentially, this one checkbox being hard-coded by a developer not realizing it would eventually apply to production added two full seconds to the page load of anyone coming into the mobile version of the Mitt Romney website. It's not something you can even like test or check for because the GUI setting you're supposed to control it with had been completely overridden in a way that you would never sensibly think to do so. 
Oops. There we go. Uh, we had all kinds of features like that where we would think we would set a configuration and then somehow it would reset or get unset or someone not realizing the implications would go and change it. Uh, you can kind of just see it in the lower left, that American flag. Uh, that's actually my name on there. Um, spoilers, my name's not supposed to be on the front page of Mitt Romney's website. <laughs> When it got there, I immediately saw some 30-something people from the Obama campaign uh, looking me up on LinkedIn. Uh, they all suddenly started hitting my profile, hitting my personal blog, trying to figure out who the hell is that guy? Now, one of the uh, weirdest ones that we ran into uh, as a result of the lack of coordination, just too many people who didn't have an understanding of what we need to have a large, nationally visible, highly scalable website. We actually had an SSL whitelist. What do I mean by whitelist? I mean there was a whitelist of pages that you were allowed to use SSL on. So, you know, they tried. You know, and there's like login there, there's users there. Uh, as it turns out, that's after we patched it because they didn't have every possible login form there. So I had to go show that to one of our developers as to why SSL is very important to have on a website that national figures are logging into. But I think my favorite example of the lack of coordination, uh, these are jobs numbers. Uh, essentially, they represent the uh, change in the amount of jobs. So you can see like the recession, Obama taking office. Um, it's a little bit hard to see on the scale, but uh, you see it goes up to you know maybe like 100K to 200K are uh, reasonable job numbers you might encounter. Uh, well, we, I had mentioned this uh, stored donation feature. It was called Victory Wallet. The way Victory Wallet worked, uh, we would store an authorization token from a uh, credit card processor. Not your credit card information, but something that would allow us to use your credit card again. And you could go log back into the site and click the $50 button and you would donate $50. So that's a really effective feature, it works. They decided they wanted this for uh, mobile as well. So. Uh, they added it for mobile by way of SMS short codes. These are the things that you like text this number to donate $50 to Haiti. It gets processed through your uh, provider. So, okay, that makes sense. You have this SMS uh, short code thing where if you hit it, it hits an API and it makes the website donate like 50 bucks for you. That's fine. Well, there was also this other feature where they were uh, sending trivia questions to people over SMS, just ways to keep them engaged. And one of the trivia questions that they had sent out was, what do you think the jobs numbers are going to be this month? So these jobs numbers are on the order of 100, 200K, but they're still numbers. Which meant that if you sent it in as just 500,000 without you know, a K at the end or something like that, it would donate that much money because they had reused the SMS short code. <laughs> Um, the good news is that we did not actually ever charge anyone for this because uh, that would have been incredibly illegal. We were able to block them, but uh, I'm pretty sure there was not a drop of blood in my project manager's face at that point. But somehow we lived through to the debates. And in fact, the website had increased in traffic probably about tenfold, while also getting like more than 50% faster. So we were pretty proud of what we managed to do. <laughs> And a large part of that was being less ambitious in trying to copy what Obama was doing and accepting that the wrong decisions had been made early on. We were going to have to cope with the state of the website, but we could at least try and do whatever we had the time for to make it more scalable, to make it more reliable, to make it a better experience for users. Now, uh, the media coverage of this was intense. We had monitors running right above our uh, workstations all the time. We had uh, now the general money, so we started hiring like crazy. There were literally desks jammed in every hallway with people working. And then we hit the debates themselves. And I don't even have to tell you how this went, because I was smart and I took a video. which I think might not actually work in uh, PowerPoint. There we go. That works. <laughs> okay. You can see just how many files I have on my desktop. Uh, there we go. Oh, wow. Oh, that is fantastic. Lord 
This is fantastic. Governor Romney's called Come on. $5 billion tax cut. No, what's going on? Pay so it, I can't what happened in the uh, third debate is Mitt Romney said, you know, you should go check out my platform on MittRomney.com on national television. That's what we were filming. Our site went from like 2,000 to 5,000 simultaneous users to peaking at about 50,000 simultaneous users. Anyone want to guess how long that took? About one minute. That well we actually managed to stay standing during this. All right, and uh, there's the chart. You can see I'm hovering over, and you see the giant spike in throughput, and you see a tiny bump in latency. So we got like maybe 10 to 50% slower, uh, but we actually stayed up. We didn't crash. We were thrilled with this. But that was about the last major thing that we did. Because the thing to understand with a campaign is it's a risk to do a deployment, and it's always going to be a risk regardless of how good your CI pipeline is. Because later on in the campaign, you have a lot more attention, but you also have a lot less time to cause anything to happen. If you roll out an awesome new donation form the day before the election, you're getting like, what, 1% of your total possible donations affected by this change that maybe increases by 1%. You have to do things as early as possible to have the most amount of impact. But also, donations themselves become less important in the last few days of the campaign. What really matters is get out the vote effort. Rolling out something that breaks out, uh, get out the vote, would be a huge problem for the campaign. Uh, I'm gonna skip over some of the uh, demographic slides here. Um, I don't know if that, unfortunately, we did break get out the vote. Uh, or I should say, we didn't break get out the vote. The people who originally programmed it broke get out the vote, and then nobody ever bothered checking that it was working until it was time to get out the vote, at which point it was too late to actually fix it. The one on the right is actually on election day. The entire system was broken. So that's not a really auspicious way to lead into the slide saying election day. Uh, you may have uh, seen some pictures of this thing in the media. That's uh, TD Garden in Boston. Uh, this is actually Orca, that's what it looked like. Uh, I took that photo myself, I got to do a backstage tour of it. Um, in fact, I even got to go down on the floor and see all the frustrated volunteers. No, no, our Get Out the Vote page was not related to Orca. Uh, the failure there was similar, though. With Orca, they built this really complex system and then they never bothered to check that it was working or tell anyone else that they were working on it or load test it or anything. Uh, with the Get Out the Vote pages, something similar had happened. People had coded the functionality in a really shoddy way. Nobody had audited it. Nobody had checked to make sure it was working. It seemed to work occasionally when we would go check at the page, but it was very intermittent. We were never really able to fully resolve the bugs because we hadn't thoroughly tested it from all kinds of locations uh, with all different types of data sets. So this really sums up the mood of the campaign. Like the people on the floor frustrated, wanting to do something, not believing that it was possible that they had basically just lost the election. Uh, I got to go to the uh, election night uh, victory party uh, for Romney. Uh, that was uh, right near my uh, current workplace, actually. Uh, so that's me uh, over on the left. Uh, with uh, Those are the rest of our senior developers. So that is the entire like senior development team at uh, Mitt Romney, uh, the people actually writing code. Um, so for those of you who don't know how this worked out, uh, Mitt Romney lost, by the way. Uh, lost really, really badly, because while well, he came pretty close in the popular vote, he got totally demolished in the battleground states, which is where it actually mattered. Just demographic trend-wise, a lot of people are gonna vote Republican, but what really matters is the handful of states where the outcome is uncertain. And there was some uncertainty because the campaign had a really poor analytics structure. They essentially didn't know that they were going to lose until very, very late the night of. Uh, you can see this is from uh, just after midnight. They're still thinking there might be a recount, but it didn't even come close to those kinds of margins. So we have inability to perform get out the vote operations on multiple levels within the organization. We had inaccurate polls. We have no concession speech. This was a campaign that did not realize that it was about to get clobbered. So the aftermath, it's not a happy office to walk into. Um, you know, even if you do want to see Romney lose, uh, it's just really uh, depressing uh, actually being around people who have just lost in a way like that. But we did manage to accomplish a lot given our very limited resources. Uh, I didn't actually talk about the scale of hiring. Uh, I mentioned that we ramped up from about, um, 
uh, 14 uh, people on the digital team, and that's not 14 developers, that's 14 people. And digital is including things like people posting to social media. Uh, we ramped up to about 110, and that was over the course of six months. The Romney campaign was able to build this large infrastructure um, to do these awesome things with analytics because they employed hundreds of people for 20 months. Now, we still did most that we could. Uh, you can see that's our uh, performance trend line over time. But the blame game started pretty quickly. Uh, I think this is why a lot of people from the Romney campaign haven't talked about it, because uh, they've already found their scapegoats. They think they know who is responsible. But what I'd argue is that what's really responsible here is the structure of the election system, the people who had been in power prior to the election, the ideological differences between Democrats and Republicans affecting hiring. Simply put, there wasn't a lot of freedom to go do this initial long-term investment uh, unless Romney had decided to spend a huge sum of his own money to do this, it was never going to happen. And he happened to have access to that, but actually a lot of the Republican candidates wouldn't have been able to if they had been the one who had been selected. So they asked us at the end of the campaign, uh, you know, what we um, uh, thought about what worked, what didn't. So I have a few lessons that I uh, think that the campaign would have been better to understand. One is false equivalence. Uh, unfortunately, I had to cut some of the slides just due to time constraints, but there were a lot of statements from the Romney campaign where if you read them, uh, like that TechCrunch article that I included at the beginning, you would think that the Obama and Romney campaigns had the exact same amount of money, had the exact same amount of voters, uh, were doing the same things with technology. But the Romney campaign actually had an extremely limited technology base, mostly outsourced, a large degree of consultants, trying to build something very unambitious and mostly copying what the Obama team had done. It wasn't a winning strategy. What really won was early investment. It's not that the Obama team had amazingly skilled engineers. I mean, they did, but if the GOP had tried to hire really skilled engineers in 2008, they also could have had really skilled engineers at that point. Because that's the key difference, the thing that doesn't get talked about that much with the Obama team. We talk about the really cool things that they built with technology. We don't talk about the circumstances under which they did it. Uh, it's just you know magical and cool that they did a startup within the uh, DNC to try and build this, but we don't talk about why they had the resources to do that. And that's because it was a very intentional investment in the value of this technology. You can't just see a technology and hop on it and say, yeah, I'm gonna go pour like 50 million dollars like six months before an election. It doesn't work that way. You need to have people who understand it, preferably people who helped build it. Shared resources. Uh, what really worked for Obama was he knew that he was going to be able to take advantage of any investment he made in 2008. So you have this incumbent effect. But it doesn't have to be the same person because in principle, Hillary could be using the same stuff that Obama was using in 2012 or extensions to it. What really matters is that you have a line of succession. Uh, you have the ability to cooperate. And that's something that didn't occur uh, within the Republican uh, leadership. And I suspect a large part of that is it's a very divided organization, particularly with the advent of the Tea Party. Um, it, it used to be possible because all campaigns were very heavily structured the same based on things like direct mail and phone calls uh, to go just stick to the same plan and repeat it and basically start from scratch every time. That's not really possible with technology. Uh, Zach Moffat, the director of digital, his idea was that you're just gonna take a bunch of APIs and glue them together. And I don't know a single project that has ever actually worked on. And for the final point, I'd say technical leadership. Now this is different from technical management. Uh, we had tons of project managers, but what we didn't really have was a senior technical person, like a CTO level, someone who actually does understand technology and is capable of implementing it, but is really directing other people to implement it. Someone who's really a leader rather than just a manager. Uh, that kind of vision is important, and it doesn't have to be a very uh, intense vision. Actually, uh, Harper Reed, the uh, CTO uh, on the Obama side, uh, he even described their infrastructure as being very simple. Like, yes, it was big, but they didn't do anything really fancy with it. They could kind of predict what they would have to do to build each step of this large infrastructure. What really mattered was the ability to plan that out, to understand that it would become relevant. That's what I really mean by vision. You don't have to pull some awesome dark magic. You just need to know what you need to execute on and then build the team that's capable of doing it. 
So I'll close with just a few uh, notes on election 2016. I think it's gonna be pretty interesting because this time around, you are gonna have primaries on both sides. Uh, you are going to have uh, PACs still, unless there's a major, major um, change in the landscape. You're gonna have more money than ever before. You're gonna have more social media than ever before. The same trends that shaped the Republican side of the campaign are gonna be shaping both sides in this election cycle. And now is really the time that that's getting kicked off. People right now are building the software that's going to monitor you, going to try and convince you to convince your friends to vote. So I think that even if you're not that interested in politics, it's a good thing to be aware of that even though we're in 2014, it's actually not too early to start thinking about what's gonna happen in 2016 from a political technology point of view. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you all for coming to this. I know it's uh, really late in the day. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah, way in the back. Um, so for OFA, which is the Obama side, the organizing for America, uh, is planning to continue on and pass the technology and their, their staff and process and their analytics and all that stuff to the next campaign. You said that both sides are kind of rebooting, but I was just wondering, is there anything from the Romney side that's getting passed on to the next side, or are they starting to catch it? They are starting from scratch because uh, remember this was all going through a consulting organization. So um, targeted victory, I know that they're still using the same code base. I've talked to some of the folks from there. Uh, but they're not necessarily going to be who gets chosen as a consultant because a lot of people were very dissatisfied with the work that they did. I know they've been contracting with uh, Rubio. And actually just today, uh, there was some news that Romney may run again in 2016, in which case he'd be very likely to pick them. Uh, but there are some other candidates who would have nothing to do with them. So it's really a toss up. Uh, the GOP itself, has been doing things. They've made some investments. They did a startup within their organization, Parabellum Labs, uh, that's been kicking around for about a year now. Uh, honestly, I'm pretty skeptical of their attempts to catch up given how badly they've messed this up the past few cycles, uh, but it's possible they could catch up because actually in uh, 2004, they were the ones who were ahead in technology. Uh, so it's really possible for this to swing back and forth. It's not something like liberals are better at technology. It's not that simple. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, do you regret not killing the site completely and just replacing the red too? Yeah, uh, that was actually something that uh, was intensely regretted. Uh, people really soured on Drupal because of the negative experiences they'd had. Uh, they wanted to move it all to WordPress at a certain point, but they weren't able to uh, convince people that it was going to be a good investment. But uh, I think given the team that we had, uh, it made sense to stick with Drupal because uh, these weren't people very familiar with WordPress, and WordPress has all kinds of problems with its own. Um, taking a, a large refactoring like that, that's a serious proposition that late in a national campaign. Okay, any other questions? Oh, a few back there. Yeah. In terms of the architecture, you kind of described a bunch of uh, kind of failure modes for uh, you know, when you were running problems. You say, like, are we going to top two things you would do differently? Um, oh, that's a tough question. I would have it be uh, very much more API driven. Um, a large reason that we weren't able to do certain kinds of functionality is because Drupal, uh, it's very mixed. There are some parts of that are API driven and some parts that are absolutely not. Uh, essentially, all of our data was being stored in Drupal and if it can't handle something like statistics, then you have to turn statistics off because you can't swap in a different backend or anything like that. Uh, so I'd say that would be number one. Um, Number two, just better capacity planning. Uh, knowing that you're gonna have things like uh, contention and lock issues, uh, we didn't really ever plan for that. It's kind of a miracle that we were actually able to get past that because Drupal has very large problems with that at scale. That's actually what most of our outages were for. That's why we were able to have improving performance the whole time yet still have major outages because we kept having lock issues and contentions and cache clears. Yeah. Um, so at one point I like sat down some of the senior digital staff and the project managers and I walked them through like we can't do this, this is killing us and I thought it worked for like two days and then we were back to square one. What really mattered was showing them proof that the performance of our site sucked and that it was fixable. That's what really won them over. So uh, basically like do it and then ask for permission. 
And that can be really hard on some kinds of projects, unfortunately, but I'd say isolate it to whatever component you can, uh, get some free time to work on and show that it is going to be a valuable investment because people really like proof in that kind of uncertain situation. Yeah. Did you get a work uh, on any, of, I guess, voter databases, large chunks of, of users? And uh, so yes and no. Uh, anyone who went and did the uh, victory wallet stuff, who like signed up for the site, they could do things like go post um, that they were going to start their own fundraiser and share it to Facebook, and then anyone else could go in and donate to their fundraiser. There was like a leaderboard. Uh, so I got to work with that set of data. So it was in at least the tens of thousands of people who did that. But it's not uh, really a voter set. Uh, that's something that's really more available at the campaign level. We uh, were not very integrated in the campaign. That's another major difference. Digital was really a standalone effort because we didn't have the capacity to do integrations. We hadn't planned on doing them from day one, and we just couldn't tack them on. Uh, our integration was essentially export to Salesforce. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Uh, thank you all for showing up for this, I appreciate it.